Inside the Harvard Museum, just beyond the serene interior, a back wall awash in vibrant, sometimes muted, and often mesmerizing colors. See, look at this one. An enchantment of more than 3,000 powdered pigments. But this is not an exhibit. It's a rare library of sorts, complete with a card catalog of colors. So a pigment is a colored particle that is used to give color to paint. And it can come from plants, it can come from animals, it can come from minerals, it can come from a chemistry lab. The keeper of the keys, if you will, to the Forbes Pigment Collection, Narayan Kandakar. It was put together by Edward Forbes, who is the second director of the museum. He was very, very interested in understanding how a work of art is made, what it's made of. Edward Waldo Forbes spent a great deal of his 30 plus years at the museum, building the base for what you see today. So the collection grew in this slightly haphazard, but increasingly well-known way. While many of the earliest pigments were derived from accessible nature, if you've ever stumbled on ochres on the ground, it's an amazing sight. If you take an insect that lives on an oak tree, you can squash it and extract a bright red color. And that color is called kermes, which is the origin of the color crimson. Others have been extracted in interesting places. This is the um, Indian yellow. It is the dried urine of cows fed only on mango leaves. One of the, the rare pigments that we have is one called Tyrian purple, and it comes from the murex mollusk. And there's a gland in the mollusk that secretes a liquid, and that's collected and exposed to the sun. And it goes from clear to red, blue, or purple. And to make about a gram of pigment takes something like 10,000 mollusks. People like Cleopatra would dye her barge sail purple. So if you think about how many mollusks had to die to make her barge purple, that tells you she was the most important person in that country. From pigments that date back thousands of years to one of the newest blue hues on the block, Yinmen, or Oregon Blue. It's not every day that something like this happens. That was the first new inorganic pigment that had been developed for about 200 years. Colour's so important to people. It's, it's been there right from the beginning. If you look at the oldest cave paintings, people who were doing these pictures weren't just using charcoal out of the fire. This here is Egyptian blue, very first man-made pigment that we know of. The pigments here are used by scientists and artists alike to find answers sometimes masked by history. For me, it's completely indispensable because it forms our reference collection. We're comparing all of our samples that we take from artworks to it. Pigments can reveal a fascinating story about art, help decipher real from fake, and even give clues to the geography of the time. A process now part of an exhibit at Harvard called Funerary Portraits from Roman Egypt, Facing Forward. It's an exhibit about the Roman Egyptian funerary portraits in our collection, of which we have five painted panel portraits that are nearly 2,000 years old, and they were made to depict people that had died and to bring their identity into the afterlife. So they would have been attached to the mummified remains. Everything that we are able to learn about them, how they were made, and what materials were used to make them, we had to learn from the objects themselves, and that's what this show is about. It's about how we know what we know about the portraits. Well, a big part of that is what pigments were used. With a mix of science and history, they are able to pull out the source materials of color. In this case, identify the roots Egyptians often used to make red. One of the most exciting imaging techniques is to use ultraviolet radiation. This root system here, it's used to produce matter lake. It's a pigment that's made from a red dye. UV conditions where it, the paint it can look pink or red, and under UV it glows this bright orangey. And so you can diagnose it without having to touch the painting. These masks contain a fascinating discovery, a material previously known to exist in Mars, but not on the palette. Over here we have a mineral called alanite. 
And it's not something that's used nowadays as a pigment, but we found it in one of the portraits in our collection. And once we uh, realized what it was, you know, we talked to some of our other collaborators and we've realized that other portraits in other collections across the world, they have this mineral too. A toolbox with a window to the past, an idea of what an artist studio may have looked like long before Newton's color wheel came along. The full pigment collection at the museum is not actually open to the public, but there is a display case featuring some of the rare colors that visitors can view. When Nicole was there, it contained a black pigment made entirely from air pollution. And back to that discovery of a new shade of blue, Yinmin blue was discovered by accident by a professor at Oregon State University. The pigment is noteworthy for its vibrant, near-perfect blue color.